I think when we started this store, there was a start of the the growth of the spiritual community that that swept across not only this country but throughout the world. Uh, it was a time when teachers were coming from India. People like the Beatles were talking about their teacher, and there was definitely a revolution of sorts happening with the young people. The hippie revolution, you'd call it in a way. We were definitely part of that. I recall that there were articles written at various newspapers around town, and eventually they, they referred to the store as, a, as the spiritual center of Los Angeles. It just grabbed people's imagination, and they suddenly began to see, you know, those eternal truths that they were in the books. A lot of the customers felt that it was sort of an oasis and that it was free of the outside turmoil. You were both in the engineering department where you were analyzing complex military systems and making anti-ICBM weapons, and there was a war going on. You started reading some of the Eastern writings and you realized, good gracious, <laughs> what are we doing all this for? More and more we, we got disenamored with the idea of playing nuclear war games. And it was like, well, there must be something better to do with our lives. As good engineers, we drew big circles on a map, and within those circles, we started looking at what part of the cities might be of interest to have our bookstore. We bumped into this property in West Hollywood, a California mission-style house of two bedrooms with wood floors, and this is it! <laughs> As we were building all this stuff, we also went to school at the American Bookseller Association and learned how to do a bookstore. Then we started deciding on what to order, and that started our really listening to customers and other people. They would suggest things to us, and from there, we would order them and, and build up. So the store became very successful very fast. It was always interesting how many musicians did drop by, like Ringo, and I can remember when David Boy stopped by one time. One of the longtime regulars was Diana Ross. Everybody got really excited when Prince was there. Catherine Hepburn came in, I think it was somewhere in about 1972, and somewhere in our archives, we have a copy of her sales slip. I think it came to about $3. <laughs> But that was in the days when, when a book only cost two dollars. Shirley McLean, when she came in and wrote a book uh, out on a limb. This is not my day. Must be a reason. Spare me the metaphysics till we get in the bookstore. Because of her, there was a, an explosion of publishing having to do with the various topics that she was interested in. Every major publisher now was starting to publish these new age type of books. And I figured out why you got that flat tire. Why? Because you're supposed to spend a lot of time in here. Deepak Chopra is someone that we did book signings with him. He used to just pop in the store sometimes. He'd come in and, you know, nobody would make a fuss about him. Marianne Williamson, she came to us when she wrote her first book, and we did a book signing with her. And I think we did book signings with her every year since then. Lucky that we happened to be at a particular place and it sort of grew by itself and became a, an entity, a live entity. I think part of the problem in the 1970s is if you were interested in Buddhism or any one of the Eastern religions, there was virtually no bookstore that stocked the material. It just wasn't here in Los Angeles. There wasn't anywhere to go that you could find this, and uh, Amazon didn't exist at the time. From the get-go, we were really quite interested in having a comprehensive selection of all religions, everything. Physical well-being, people were interested in yoga, and, and all of a sudden they wanted books on homeopathy. You couldn't find them anywhere. We started building this giant homeopathy section that people would come from 50, 60 miles around there, just. It was really a marvel because they were really interested in changing their life. My feeling is that we have acted as sort of a, a, a seeding process, that we haven't converted the world, but we certainly have influenced a great many people to change their lives, but not by what we dictate, but by but what they have come to realize for themselves. 
people used to come in there as the years went on and they'd say, Phil, I can't tell you, you know, how you saved my life with your bookstore. I was down and out, I was strung out, and I came in here and you let me read books all day. I kept thinking, wow, I never expected running a bookstore that you know, where you save people's life, but it was really touching. Well, I think that in letting it go, certainly there's, there's a certain amount of sadness about that. But from just a point of view of practicality, the store was, was simply, with the way it was structured, the size and various other things, was economically no longer viable. It had to change in some way. You know, we just found ourselves getting older and it was hard, you know, because we spent 42 plus years there. I think the Bodhi tree followed what was probably a fairly natural progression. Technology is a large part of it. And Amazon came along and people would come in and look at our books and they'd write down the ISBA number and then go, go home and order them on their computers. You wouldn't even have to do that after a while. They'd just flash it over phones. <laughs> In the transcendental meditation world, they thought that if X number of people meditated, that would be enough to transform the world. 10%. 10%. Well, the world seems to be growing so we're in a, a trough right now, but there's still these possibilities of, of great transformation. We found that we could not really be judgmental about whatever book we had in the store because someone had come along and that was a particular, this little dumb thing that we thought was really stupid, that was the thing that was the seed for them to make that, that leap. And so it's pretty exciting. The energy of the Bodhi tree can pass along to new entities and keep it going, you know. The history is not past, it's not dead, it's alive. And that as you move along, all you do is, is you rebuild it again. You discover something new and you rebuild it totally. So there's this freshness to everything if you look at it that way. It's always new. 